Chang in San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. A global legal battle that has dragged on for years is over. Apple and Qualcomm have settled their differences at least for the next six years. Plus Netflix gives an underwhelming forecast in its earnings results saying price increases in some countries will slow subscriber growth. This as Disney, Apple and Warner Media fire up their competition. And behind the scenes of Facebook, interviews with more than 60 current and former employees paint the picture of what one journalist calls a fresh hell. But first to our lead. Apple and Qualcomm agreed to end a two-year legal battle over billions of dollars of technology licensing fees that threatened to jeopardize Qualcomm's most profitable line of business. Shares of the chipmaker surged more than 20 percent on the news Tuesday. Here to discuss the details of the settlement, I want to go to Bloomberg's Ian King and Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who is outside the courthouse in San Diego, where a trial was just getting underway between these two companies, Mark, and opening statements were happening as this news came in. Set the stage for us. So we were in round three of opening statements. This morning kicked off with Apple's lawyers giving their perspective. Then you had the contract manufacturers, which basically is the consortium of Foxconn, Pegatron, and others. And then after them, you had Qualcomm taking the stand. Now we were about 10 minutes away of Qualcomm finishing their prepared opening remarks. Then the news came in from Apple about, about the settlement. And it was interesting because the lawyers kept going. It didn't seem like the lawyers were aware of what had been happening outside the courtroom. So, Ian, you were just on the show yesterday previewing what was going to happen. Jury selection was underway. You've been covering the chip industry for two decades. Are you surprised? that they came to terms here after all this bitterness. Well, you remember what we said yesterday, right? We, you, you showed that clip of your interview with Milenkov where he said, look, this is business, this will work itself out. And I said, well, we've, we've seen this kind of bitterness transform in a second to uh, a collaborative relationship that appears to be what we have here. So Apple and Qualcomm released a joint statement saying that they, Apple, will be paying Qualcomm a right. one-time payment, right. that they have reached this six-year licensing agreement as well as a multi-year chipset supply agreement. Can yeah. you tell us more? I mean, what is the amount of this payment? Right. The only clue we have so far is that Qualcomm said this will be worth $2 in EPS for them on an annual basis. The analysts and the investors I spoke to said, look, you know, using this assumption, that assumption, if you back that out, it looks like Apple has agreed to pay roughly the same licensing percentage that everybody else has to pay. If that's the case, this is a victory for Qualcomm. So can you put that into billions for me? <laughs> well, I'm asking the, you to do math on the yeah, spot. We'll put it this way. On, on an annual basis, Qualcomm is earning roughly $2 a share. So, sorry, $4 a share in EPS. So this is adding 50% to that. So that's a lot of money. So, Mark, does this seem to be Apple waving the white flag, Apple giving in? You know, I think it, not really Apple waving the white flag and Apple giving in, but more so Apple putting the consumer and its flagship product ahead of litigation. Now, this seems to be an extremely important fight for Tim Cook personally. And, you know, Apple as a whole going after Qualcomm for what they believe to be, you know, overcharging or double dipping, as they've been calling it uh, all morning. But more so now, they're saying, hey, we realize we need to be in 5G. This is more of an admission of Apple saying they, they don't think Intel is capable of giving them the 5G modems as early as the end of next year, as Intel and Apple had been anticipating for months now. It also means that Apple's own in-house chip efforts are likely, you know, ways off. That six-year agreement, I think, is going to become a moot point in three or four years when Apple will inevitably have its own modems ready. Interesting. And Apple CEO Tim Cook and Qualcomm CEO Steve Molenkov were expected to testify in this particular trial, right. trial which really upped the ante, Ian. Yeah. But does this agreement means, mean the core issues go away? I mean, Apple is complaining that Qualcomm is charging too much, abusing its market yeah. dominance. Qualcomm is saying, look, these are the rules. We own these patents, and sorry, you have to pay. Yeah. That's not going to change. I mean, there's, there's a couple of factors at play here. You'll remember that there was an FTC trial basically accusing Qualcomm of the practices that you just mentioned that that we still don't have a result in there we still have to see how that will play out but fundamentally 
this is, you know, you've got technology and you've got licensing. Qualcomm has pretty much throughout its history faced a series of legal challenges um, trying to get those license fees reduced. It's managed to, by and large, defend them off. Of course, we're likely to see more. Of course, as companies come and go in terms of the power of, of, of their customer base, they're going to try to challenge this because it helps their profits. Now, Mark, you had reported that Apple had postponed 5G this year, would perhaps consider it next year. Does this mean that Apple could bring 5G even sooner? I mean, could it be in, in the, the phones that are unveiled as we expect them to be in the fall? It's, it's too late for Apple. You know, bearing some miracle of engineering, uh, I don't see there being a chance that Apple has a 5G device out on the market this year. But what this does do is give them a much cleaner and clearer path to getting it on the market in 2020 around their next September, October, November iPhone cycle, uh, the iPhone you know, 12 or whatever they, they choose to call it. There had been some concern of them being able to get the right amount of chips from Intel or the proper processing power for, for 5G from the Intel modems, now that all goes out the window because you have the best in Qualcomm, the market leader in 5G components, now under an agreement for the next six years with Apple. Yeah, and you're nodding. Yeah, no, it's 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 technology decision. I mean, these things take about 18 months. You know, chip to make alone takes three months. Never mind the qualification and the networks. Never mind integrating it into your device. Never mind writing the software. So it, it's not going to happen this year. Um, it can't. Basically, there's just not enough time. All right, Bloomberg's Ian King and Mark German will continue to cover uh, the story and bring you any more headlines as they unfold. Meantime, IBM reported a decline in revenue from the cloud computing, AI, and cognitive software unit that the company is hanging its future on. Revenue from that business totaled $5 billion, down 2% from the same period a year earlier. Total revenue for the first quarter missed forecasts at $18.2 billion, down nearly 5% from the first quarter of 2018. Coming up, Netflix slides after hours as forecast for new user growth trail estimates. What it means for competitors like Disney. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Netflix shares dropped in after hours trading instantly after reporting its first quarter results. Shares, though, now pairing their losses. The last quarter was relatively strong. The streaming platform added the most customers ever, 9.6 million of them. But that didn't stop the stock from dropping. The forecast for the second quarter was fairly underwhelming. Netflix said it would add 5 million customers, short of the more than 6 million forecast by analysts. Netflix says price increases in the U.S., Brazil, Mexico, and parts of Europe will slow subscriber growth for a brief period but won't affect growth in the long run. But what about the competition it might see from Apple or Disney? Joining us to discuss, Marianne Montaigne of Gradient Investments. Gradient owns Netflix in its growth portfolio and core select portfolio. Also with us, True Optic CEO Andre Swanston. True Optic runs an audience measurement and data management platform that works across the over-the-top <laughs> ecosystem. So, Andre, what's your take on the headline numbers here, you know, beating forecasts for the current quarter, but uh, not for what's to come. Yeah, you know, I, I think I may come off as very contrarian, but I, I almost didn't care what Netflix uh, reported in terms of Q1 and, and their guidance for Q2, I think, is somewhat irrelevant as well in terms of the long-term um, outlook. Uh, really, I think Netflix is facing huge headwinds when, you know, Apple Plus and Disney Plus, uh, as well as all the, the, the massive growth that we're seeing across free ad-supported over the top and connected TV solutions come in. So I, I think Q4 of this year is when, you know, they'll for the first time truly have real direct head-to-head -head competition. And I, and I think it's going to be a, a challenge for them. Marion, you're an investor in Netflix. Do you care? <laughs> yeah, I care. And the way I see it is you're going to have some competition from Apple, but we really don't know what it is. What they told us was very, very slim. And when it comes to Disney, I think that they can coexist with Netflix. I don't think the parents are going to be watching Disney after 830 at night. That's just not the history of computers in general and uh, cable TV in particular. So those two together would still be under $20 a month. And I think that 
that's something that they can very much coexist with. So uh, I sat down with Bob Iger, uh, the CEO of Disney, when they unveiled Disney Plus, and he talked about why he thinks w the details of this service will be competition for Netflix and all the rest. Take a listen. Making them available uh, on a new technology platform, on technology platform that is simply more modern and I think growing in popularity at a price that makes sense with a user interface that's beautiful, I think that's why we feel confident. That so he's talking about the entire Disney vault, animated classics going back decades, as well as uh, new original content. Andre, do you think customers are going to pay for that and Netflix? Uh, I, I think, you know, people like me that could, you know, don't even look at their bill can when it comes to that. But there's a lot of Americans that 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 can't afford to and will prioritize. I think some of the things that, you know, if we look at this as just kind of common sense, you know, what business could you of any, of any industry? Could you lose your best selling product or some of your most valuable products to the, the business right next to you? And then they undercut you on price and it doesn't impact you. Um, I think the other thing that a lot of people aren't realizing is that the real growth over connected the TV over the last 24 months has been in ad supported solutions like Pluto TV and Zumo and others. And what Netflix benefited from for years was kind of being the de facto standard across over the top and connected TV. If you bought a new smart TV or you bought a Roku or you bought a, a Fire Stick, you had to get Netflix or else what was the purpose of having that device? But now what people are seeing um, across you know, 30, 35, 40 million homes is you, you buy those new devices and you turn on something free with ads. And then you can be very selective about how you add on top of that. And for any home, you know, that has a child, if you're prioritizing budget, do you prioritize Disney's whole uh, content library or, or the content that Netflix has? Um, and it's not really just children. It's the, the, the Avengers library and all the other things, um, as well as competition coming from Warner and then Apple. There's just so much. Net Netflix has never had to face so much direct competition. And where people are lowering prices, they're going to be increasing them. It's just, I, I, you know, I, I just can't find a metric by which it's not a concern. Disney's got the Star Wars library going for it as well. That said, Netflix yeah. is, you know, it's got first mover advantage. Marianne, are you concerned about the forecast here? The price increase is slowing subscri subscriber growth at the same time that for the first time ever there could be real direct competition. Uh, actually, I would say now is a great time to be raising prices because the unemployment rate is so low, the participation rate is so high, the uh, wage growth is improving, and if you're going to take a price increase, now's the time to take it. And if it's a dollar to a month, I don't think that's going to crush anybody's budget. And as I look out at the Netflix situation, they're growing very strongly overseas. They leverage the heck out of their content by dubbing or subtitles back and forth so now things made in India will be shown here either subtitles or or dubbed and I think there's just a ton of leverage to be had out of the system so we're very positive on Netflix so how do you explain what happened with the stock today I mean shares plunged 9% right after the results and now they've stabilized what happened there well you're asking me yep all right. Uh, what happened is people did not read through, and one of the things they did not read through was they beat on subscribers in both the U.S. and overseas. And when you look at that uh, guidance for the coming quarter of five million, that is uh, right in line with the consensus numbers that we've seen. So it didn't knock the cover off the ball, but it was in line. I think people too have to think back to the management guidance in recent years. Years, which has been conservative. They now have that, um, you know, common, more common attitude of we're going to guide down and then we're going to beat. And this has uh, been more frequent uh, in their situation. So we expect them to beat next quarter as well. Andre, Netflix is surely competing with companies with, with big budgets. Of course, Apple has $250 billion in cash, but, you know, they're investing multi-billions of dollars in original content over the next few years. Can they spend their way ahead of the competition? 
I mean, you know, Netflix has, has had a huge head start in terms of investing heavily in content. Um, I, I think more so they're not going to spend their way out of this because you can't spend more than these other companies if they decide that they really want to dig in as well. Um, I think there are some opportunities that Netflix could take advantage of uh, because they've been spending billions and billions of dollars for several years now. Uh, some of that content that's older, they could make ad supported. Uh, a lot of people have talked about that happening. I think that, um, you know, that's more of a reality going into 2020 if, if, if I were them. Um, I, I, I do think that that is a way they may go, but I think people are underestimating um, they are overestimating the loyalty that people have to Netflix or any or any content in, in particular. Um, their the churn rate is much higher across households that don't have a, a child uh, across any OTT subscription service than ones that don't. And so you know there's a lot of things that I think would be concerning regardless of what their their numbers are for for Q1 or Q2. Interesting. Do you go where the content is or do you stick with the platform you have? Uh, Andre Swanson, True Optics CEO, Marianne Montaigne of Gradient Investments. Thank you both. Lots to debate. Coming up, what has gone on behind the scenes at Facebook as the controversies and scandals have piled up? And can the company actually find a strategy to fight its way back? We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. It is one of the biggest and most powerful companies on the planet with more than 2 billion users. But in the last few years, the mission of Facebook to gather and share information is also turning into its biggest challenge. From Cambridge Analytica on, Facebook has seen a tidal wave of scandals and controversies causing rising distrust outside the company and rifts inside it. Wired Editor-in-Chief Nicholas Thompson took a deep dive on Facebook over the last 15 months and interviewed 65 current and former employees for the magazine's June cover story. He joins us now from New York. Nick, always great to have you with us. So what was the Good overarching narrative of these many, many employee interviews that you did? Yeah, so Fred Vogelstein and I wrote the story together and we interviewed all these employees and the overarching narrative is of a story that's paying the price for the mistakes that it made in the past. This is a company that prioritized growth over everything else. And that just came back to bite it. The bills came due. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is they lose the trust of the media, of the general public, of government. This is a problem for Silicon Valley in general. It's a problem for Facebook in particular. Part three is they're faced with all these really complicated problems. How do you improve privacy while at the same time improving safety when sometimes those things are trade-offs. So the story of the year is the story of a company grappling with all these past problems, losing people's trust, and struggling with these contradictory problems, and then kind of flubbing it all. So that's the story in a nutshell. You talk about how Facebook made some fatal mistakes in the way it handled the press through these controversies, you know, days of silence after the New York Times investigation, trying to beat the New York Times in its own reporting, do you think Facebook has figured the press out at this point, or are they still making mistakes? I don't know if they can figure the press out. I mean, they certainly have recognized their past mistakes, right? When the New York Times and others came to them with the Cambridge Analytica story, they front ran them. That's a really bad idea. You don't put out information before the press story runs, or else you alienate the journalists forever. Then they stayed completely silent when the news broke, which is also a really bad idea. So they made sort of the opposite errors. They t did too much, they did too little. They recognized that, but they're also in this kind of impossible position where because of their algorithm, they help create a news media ecosystem that prioritizes outrage, and now all the outrage is directed at Facebook. So they're in a storm of their own creating. Right. You, you talk about the wealth of antipathy that has built up. I mean, at this point, do you believe the tide has turned against Facebook for good or, or can public opinion be reversed? Public opinion can definitely reverse. And I do think there is a lag. I think that Facebook is genuinely trying to solve their problems. They, gen they genuinely are trying to look as deeply as they can, figure out how to do things better in the future, clean up mistakes from the past. But at the same time, there's nothing they can say right now that anybody will believe. They won't be trusted. They've got problems left and right. So I do think they're trying to move in the right direction. I do think it's possible that they can go in the right direction. I also think it's going to take a while. 
I wonder though, you know, in, in my own conversations with Facebook employees, the, you know, they're, they're very defensive. They defend the company that they work at. They believe that Facebook is doing the right yeah. thing. They believe that most of the scrutiny, you know, the dislike from the outside of Sheryl Sandberg, it, you know, it doesn't happen on the inside. And I wonder if there's a fundamental disconnect between the people inside Facebook who need to fix these problems and the people outside Facebook who are really upset by these problems. Well, you know, the people who were really upset by the problems and were the most strident and articulate in their critiques of the company were current employees. I mean, I couldn't put their names in the stories, but most of the people we talked to work there now and had very, you know, very thoughtful critiques of what they're doing. So I do think there are a lot of people inside the company who are, you know, as you say, true believers, and many for good reasons. And I think there's also a large number of critics who do think there needs to be a different direction, and those are on the inside and on the outside. Um, there are so many juicy details in your story. We don't have time to get to them all, but you dive into the falling out between Zuckerberg and the Instagram founders. Uh, you, you hint yep. at suspicion or perhaps even jealousy of Instagram's success to the extent that um, you know, Zuckerberg made a rule that none of the executives could sit for profiles or news interviews without the approval of, of, of Mark Zuckerberg or or. Cheryl Sandberg, you know, tell us a little bit more about the new information that you're bringing to light here. Yeah, well, so that specific thing is Facebook says that, yes, there was a rule. Nobody else could sit for a profile, but it was just so that other companies wouldn't find employees to poach. And then there are other people who were directly involved who said, no, it was aimed at keeping Kevin in his place. But the real information we have that's new is about the clash between them, where Systrom told people, was overheard telling people, that he felt like Zuckerberg was treating him the way that Trump was treating Jeff Sessions, in a way that would drive him out without having to be fired. And it is absolutely true, and this is new, that Facebook looked at all the ways they were propping up Instagram, all the ways they were driving traffic to Instagram, all the things they were doing to help Instagram, and then Zuckerberg then went to Systrom and said, we're taking these all away. All these things we've did, done to help you grow, we're not gonna do any more, you have to give a little bit back. Systrom, and this is also new, then posted it internally at Instagram, which caused a crisis, and then Systrom departed for paternity leave, came back and said, I'm going to make this leave permanent, and that was that. All right, well, we, we can't get to everything in the piece, so I highly recommend <laughs> you read it. Uh, you know, of course, Facebook continuing to grapple with all of these issues, especially in light of what happened in Christchurch, New Zealand, and that live video of a mass shooting that went up on Facebook Live, uh, and then again, hundreds of thousands of times. Um, Nick Thompson, thank you so much for sharing your story with, uh, with us. You can check it out in Wire. Nick Thompson, editor-in-chief of the magazine. Coming up. A new report says the T-Mobile Sprint deal is facing yet another big regulatory hurdle. We'll discuss the merger's most recent pushback from the U.S. Department of Justice. This is Bloomberg. Technology, I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Back to Netflix. The company's second quarter forecast fell short of analyst expectations, with the company saying it would add 5 million customers, well short of estimates calling for more than 6 million in the current quarter. Investors reacted quickly. Shares fell as much as 9.3% after hours before regaining much of that ground. You can see them now barely changed. Additionally, CEO Reed Hastings said price increases have led to some customers canceling their subscriptions in the U.S. For more, I want to bring in Bob O'Donnell, president of Technalysis Research, also with us, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw, who covers the company for us. So, so Lucas, what are the highlights here that perhaps you may not have expected? I mean, I think the, the rate of growth picking up every quarter is certainly one highlight. Adding 9.6 million, uh, biggest quarter in the company history, is a big deal. Just because when you look at a company of its scale already, Netflix has almost 150 million customers. It's a t more than 20-year-old company, and yet it continues to hit new records every year. Uh, and it's building just a huge moat around itself before the entrance of new competitors. That being said, the reason why the forecast for Q2, I think, is a little, or uh, for Q2, yeah, is a little concerning, 
is because Netflix seems to have been able to add and increase prices with impunity. It's now big enough, it says it delivers enough high quality shows that it can get away with raising prices. But if it is actually saying, well, we can raise prices, but it has some effect, that may limit its ability going forward, especially as new competitors enter the market at lower prices. Disney Plus, Disney, Disney's new service, for example, is going to be significantly cheaper than Netflix. Now, Bob, Netflix has always been a sort of polarizing service yes. among investors and analysts. You know, I've heard folks say winter is coming for them. Yeah. You know, there's no way they can keep up the spending. They can't keep up with Disney's giant existing library. You know, you don't want to rule out. Apple, you know, which side do you fall on? Well, look, I fall on the side that I think they still have opportunity. Mm -hmm. There was a very interesting data point in their shareholder letter. They said, look, 10% of TV viewing is over the top right now. That means there's a lot of opportunity. Remember, we, we get caught up in the fact that we think everybody's doing this. They're not. There are still a lot of people who are not streaming anything yet. And Netflix, for a lot of people, is the entree to over the top. So, and I think there's an opportunity for them to continue. It is is like the music business, though, in that you know you got to have hits. You got to keep the hits going. That's a hard thing to do. Um, I think Disney is competition, but in, not in a negative way. I think it's actually in. Ironically, in a bit of a positive way, because the two together become even more compelling for people to get into over the top. And I think they're complementary, complementary in many ways. Now we've talked a lot about Disney because we know what's in the library, we know what they're working on, we know the cost. We don't know any of those things for Apple, yeah. and yet even the you know legendary legends in the entertainment industry aren't counting Apple out. I sat down with Jeffrey Katzenberg, uh, founder of DreamWorks Animation, former chair of Disney for his take on what Apple is rolling out. Take a listen to what he had to say. I don't think one ever bets against uh, Apple. I don't think one bets against $250 billion of capital sitting in a bank somewhere, <laughs> you know, just racking up a whole bunch of interest. Um, I don't think you bet against, you know, the talent of that that company and Tim the Cook? ingenuity. Yeah, I, mean, I think Tim is an extraordinary leader. And so, you know, yes, it's been like this. So now they've got some headwind here. And so now they're gonna, he's going to be challenged in new ways. But um, it's a brilliant company with wildly talented people there. Lucas, what's been the word on the street about Apple and Disney since the announcements? The reaction to Disney, especially in Hollywood circles, has been very positive, impressed by just how many shows and movies they've sort of clawed back from other services and from just the breadth that they're going to release. The reaction to Apple was decidedly more mixed, I would say even negative. People were pretty disappointed by how little they had to say. To your point, we didn't learn a lot about the pricing or how the different packages will be bundled together. You talk to people who are making lots of shows for them, who sold them lots of shows, and they're still in the dark. They're basically flying blind. And given that we're talking about Netflix here, they actually compared it to Netflix in 2010, 11, 12, when Netflix was making its first deals for original shows. And talent would just have to say, you know what? We're going we're gonna to try this. We don't know how they're going to release it. We don't know how they're going to push for awards. We don't know if anybody's going to be able to watch it. But it's worth taking a bet because people like Apple. And that continues to be the, the philosophy of most of the people in the entertainment business. Whereas with Disney, people, sort of, the people know what they are getting into. They know to trust it. And they expect it to be pretty successful. We also don't know, again, how much Apple is going to cost. Bob, you, you, you watch Apple very closely. I mean, are you concerned? given all of these unanswered questions. Yeah, absolutely. I think this there is a big question mark hanging over the services businesses and the TV Plus service in particular because A, they've got to build up a library of content. B, we're not even sure what type of content they're going to be willing to do because let's be honest, a lot of the more popular content has been a little bit racier which doesn't really match with the Apple brand and that's been a question mark. Uh, and then there is how much are they going to be able to get, get away and charge people? There's the support or lack thereof on on other platforms that they haven't really been very strong about. And not everybody who owns Apple devices are only going to be able to watch Apple services. That doesn't work in the long run. You so, wonder if you'd see a Game of Thrones in all its I, nude I just, glory <laughs> on, on Apple. I, mean. I, I don't think you would. And no, look, that doesn't mean Disney has done a fantastic job with doing family friendly content. But look, they have decades and decades mm -hmm. there. Um, and Netflix is starting to build up th that library. And that's the other interesting thing. The other final point I'll make is, you know, people, I think, are going to be willing to subscribe to a few services, mm -hmm. but not 
all of them, right? And that is going to be, we're going to be back to the cable days where you're going to end up having to pick a couple of things and you're just going to go with that. And I think Apple could be on the short end. All right, well, lots to watch. Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis, always good to have you, as well as our own Lucas Shaw, who covers Netflix for us. Lucas, I know you're going to be jumping on the earnings call momentarily. Turning now to a long-awaited merger in the U.S. wireless business. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that T-Mobile and Sprint's planned tie-up is unlikely to be approved. The DOJ's antitrust division is considering whether the deal would present an unacceptable threat to competition, posing the most immediate hurdle to the deal. Let's welcome our Bloomberg Deals reporter, Nabila Ahmed, who has the latest. Nabila, I suppose this isn't necessarily surprising since the approval here has been taking a very long time, but what's your assessment? Emily, look, the DOJ staff have previously voiced their opposition to this tie-up. Remember back in 2014 when Masa Sun, whose company SoftBank controls Sprint, tried to buy T-Mobile at the time. DOJ at the time came out and voiced their opposition to this deal. So it's not a surprise that DOJ staff have, again, uh, voiced some concerns about this deal. And the distinction to be made here is between the DOJ staff and DOJ leadership. So the staff have raised their concerns. We understand there was a meeting earlier this month month where uh, Sprint and T-Mobile representatives presented to the DOJ staff. And the staff had some questions about the deal. They wanted to know more about the, the cost cuts they've talked about. They wanted to know more about competition and what would happen to competition post this deal getting done. So uh, the companies came away with that, uh, you know, understanding the concerns, but also realizing that they could probably do something else. I mean, they've always been open uh, to partially restructuring this deal. There have been, there's been talk of asset sales potential asset sales um, that they could uh, sort of do to s get get the deal through the leadership of, at the DOJ. So it's not a big surprise. I guess it's about it's a matter of time now. But I will say that the companies have said that they look to close this deal by the end of the first half, um, sort of June, July time this year, and they're still sticking to that timeline. Right. We just spoke with Marcelo Clare, the former CEO of, of Sprint last week, who was very optimistic that said, you know, the DOJ having some concerns about the deal is very different from saying it's unlikely to be approved. It sounds like you believe there's still a chance here, but it would involve some restructuring. Look, the companies want to do whatever it takes, um, you know, with, within reason to get this deal done because the cost of not getting this deal done, particularly for Sprint, uh, is really, really high. You know, the, this is an industry where scale really matters and the companies here are getting together because they believe that this achieving this kind of scale will allow them to compete better with the giants like AT&T and Verizon, who are miles ahead of these two companies and particularly for Sprint which is very much debt laden uh, there's been a lot of conversations about what would happen to Sprint if this deal didn't go through they would certainly number one would need to look for another partner uh, because we don't think that Sprint could probably survive on its own um, in the current environment and the companies together have talked about the fact that this deal they think could allow them to co cut costs by about 43 billion dollars and a lot of that would come from not having to compete on price with each other um, so so the companies are very determined to try to get this deal done and some of the things that have been mentioned for example the prepaid business is one uh, that has been targeted as a, as perhaps a divestiture candidate um, and this is sort of the prepaid pay as you go um, Wi-Fi and call business which is a very big business for these companies and it's run under the boost um, brand and also Virgin Mobile brand which you might be familiar with um, and that's been one area where uh, you know industry um, industry experts have said perhaps that's a business they could hive off to try and get the deal done. Emily. All right. Well, Bloomberg's Nabila Ahmed will continue to watch how this one develops. Thank you so much for that update. Coming up, the electric car maker that is outselling Tesla at a massive pace. BYD's big plans. Next, this is Bloomberg. In this week's Bloomberg Business Week, Americans may think of Tesla when it comes to electric cars, but China's BYD is the world's number one maker of EVs, and the Warren Buffett-backed company has even bigger ambitions. Bloomberg Business Week's Matt Campbell joins us from Washington with more on this story. And Matt, we Americans might 
best know BYD as the electric car company that Warren Buffett back. But what else do we need to know about BYD and how it compares to Tesla? Well, Emily, BYD, as you said, is an enormous company, something like a quarter million employees uh, based in uh, Shenzhen in southern China. Uh, and, and it's really uh, among a few really driving forces behind this electric revolution, which is underway in China. Uh, and, and that's a revolution that's happening far faster than just about anywhere else in the world. Uh, north of half of the EV sales worldwide happen in China. Uh, cities like Shanghai have more EVs sold every year uh, than are sold in entire countries like France or Germany. So, so BYD is right at the heart of what's happening in the world's second largest economy and, and potentially, th therefore, right at the heart of the broader electric transition, which is coming to all of us eventually. So talk to us about scale here. How much bigger is BYD than Tesla? Well, uh, in terms of sales of passenger vehicles, uh, the companies are pretty much neck and neck. Uh, sometimes Tesla a little bit ahead, sometimes BYD a little bit ahead. We'll have to see uh, how that plays out this year, and, and that, of course, has a lot to do with, with how Tesla's production goes. Where, where it gets really interesting with BYD is this mix of other vehicles that they create, that they manufacture, uh, buses, forklifts. Uh, dump trucks, uh, rubbish collection vans, the whole gamut of anything you can imagine on wheels, BYD pretty much makes it, and they make it electric. So they are offering uh, this, what they call a full market electric solution. If you want it, they can give it to you, and they can give it to you as an EV. Now, it's no secret that Tesla wants to break into China. They've broken ground on a Shanghai factory, yet they've also run into problems with uh, some vehicles being held up, for example, at customs. You know, how much of an advantage does BYD have, given that it's a Chinese company uh, and probably much friendlier with the Chinese government? Well, I, that's a very good question, Emily. Uh, the Chinese government, uh, as you know, has, has made a lot of noise in the last few months about being more open to foreign investment, uh, wanting to uh, get rid of some of the conditions that foreign business has complained about over the years. That certainly extends to the automotive industry, and, and that's why you see not only Tesla, but all the other big global automakers putting so much money into China. Uh, that said, the Chinese auto companies have a lot of brand identification in the market. They have really enormous distribution and marketing networks. Uh, but it, particularly at the higher end, uh, a Tesla is an aspirational car in China, just as, an, just as it's an aspirational car uh, in New York or in San Francisco. That brand has enormous cachet, and that's not something that BYD or, or any other Chinese manufacturer can really compete with at this point. You profile the CEO of BYD in your piece. Tell us a little bit more about him. So BYD was founded uh, in 1995 by a guy called Wang Chuanfu, uh, who was a chemist by training, actually, a, a real nerdy uh, scientist who worked on rare earth metals uh, and gradually got into the battery business. So it actually has its origins as a battery supplier, uh, sending batteries around the world, put in cell phones, cordless drills, that kind of thing. And then it branched into cars in 2003, and that was something that uh, Wang at the time was, was almost ridiculed for. It just seemed kind of crazy, the idea of, of making electric vehicles uh, almost 20 years ago. Of course, uh, after hanging on for a while and, and putting up with some, some pretty uh, weak early results, uh, BYD has turned that into an enormous EV business. All right, Matt Campbell for Bloomberg Business Week. You can check out his story in this week's coming edition. Thanks so much, Matt. You can also hear from the magazine's reporters and editors every Saturday and Sunday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Bloomberg. Well, Expedia Group is moving to simplify its ownership model and boost its value. The online travel company has agreed to acquire Liberty Expedia Holdings in a $2 billion all-stock deal. Expedia's super voting stock structure has been divided between two billionaires, Barry Diller and Liberty's John Malone. Diller will become the largest shareholder with a 29% stake. Still ahead, digital health company Everly Well wants to put health tests in the hands of consumers. How it's competing with the likes of 23andMe and other direct consumer health startups next. This is Bloomberg.
Alphabet is making its Waymo app available on the Google Play Store, starting with riders in the Phoenix area. But while the company has technically had an app for some time, it was only available to those accepted into the early rider program via a private link. Now, anyone can download the app and join the waitlist to ride. Once accepted, new users will be invited into Waymo's early rider program before moving to the public service. Well, in the last year, Americans borrowed an estimated $88 billion to pay for health care, with one in four skipping treatment due to cost. That is according to a study by Gallup and West Health. The home lab startup Everly Well wants to democratize the system. Everly Well offers a suite of at-home lab kits with over 35 panels, including tests for fertility, food sensitivity, and sexually transmitted diseases. Since 2015, it has shipped over 275,000 kits. Now the company has secured $50 million in new financing led by Goodwater Capital and Highland Partners to expand its digital platform. Joining us to discuss Everly Well, founder and CEO Julia Cheek, who is with us from New York. Julia, thanks so much for joining us. So tell us exactly how the platform works. You develop these kits and you also sell them direct to consumer and in retail stores. Hi, Emily. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so Everly Well is transforming the $25 billion lab testing industry, and the kits themselves are actually a way to make the process more accessible and convenient for consumers. So we actually work with fully certified regulated labs that have been around for a long time working with physicians and hospitals and are simply using existing technology to be able to make a service that is suitable for home kit collection by a consumer and then mailed off and resulted in a certified lab. Talk to us a little bit about the technology here and how proven it is. I mean, any time you say, you know, at home testing kit, that's, you know, can, can raise some alarm bells when you're doing something outside the doctor's office. How proven is the technology that you're using? I think what's important here is that Everly Well is the connector. We are not inventing any new lab testing technology or assays, and all of the labs that we work with pre-exist our company and have been in business for years or even decades. And so what we are making easier is the home collection process of a sample um, using materials that have been validated and are cleared for use via various federal and state regulatory bodies. So the testing itself is just as accurate as the same test that your doctors and physicians typically use. And in fact, we work um, both with an independent physician network to review the orders and the results, as well as work with physicians around the country that our consumers share their results with. So as I understand it, your tests aren't FDA approved. And so some of the critics say this is a way to get around FDA approval. How do you respond to that? So laboratory testing in the United States is regulated by two federal bodies, the FDA as well as the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, otherwise known as CMS. CMS is the regulatory body that currently regulates the tests that Everly Well offers through our network of labs. Um, that is generally through um, a, a, a body of legislation called CLIA. All of the labs that we work with meet and exceed federal regulations for lab testing, um, as well as meet or exceed the state-by-state -state regulations. So should the FDA choose to um, regulate our type of lab testing, we would love and, and be excited to engage with them on that. So how do you help people understand what the test results show, whether they really have a food sensitivity or maybe it's a sign of something more severe like cancer or maybe it's an eating disorder? I mean. Can the test really tell you that at home? I think what's important here is that we are making it very accessible for consumers to get accurate, insightful, and clear lab results. These results are not only reviewed by independent board certified physicians, but then are also available and encouraged to be shared with consumers' primary care physicians. In fact, 80% of our customers have a primary care physician and 60% report using these results directly with their physicians. And so the goal is really to provide a service that closes the care gap of consumer compliance around lab testing, something like 40% of Americans don't get testing done due to a fear of cost. Um, and so our goal is to be able to increase that rate of getting testing done so that it's a useful experience for people and then they can work in conjunction with their healthcare provider as well as with their own lifestyle and wellness plans to improve their health.
Now, I'm sure whether you like it or not, you're compared to Theranos all the time. I realize they were creating technology and, and, and you are not creating lab testing technology. However, the sort of spectacular failure of Theranos is very fresh in the health tech industry. You know, what can you say to, to assure consumers and your customers that, you know, everything that you're providing them is sound? The most important point to know about the Everlywell brand is the network of labs that we partner with work already with physicians and hospitals. They existed before we had this digital model to be able to allow consumers to initiate test orders. And so they are relied upon by many of the top physician networks and hospitals in the country. And we also work with some of the larger labs in the country as well. And obviously there have been uh, parallels made, but I think the most important point is that we are really connecting people to proven technology, similar to what a Warby Parker model did, which is connecting people to more affordable eyeglasses and, and a physician prescription service and not creating anything new. All right, Everly Well CEO and founder Julia Cheek, thanks so much for joining us. We can certainly agree there's a lot of friction in the lab testing process that, and that there is certainly room for improvement. Finally, we have an update on the Wall Street Journal T-Mobile Sprint story. The CEO of T-Mobile just tweeted, the premise of this story, as summarized in the first paragraph, is simply untrue. Out of respect for the process, we have no further comment. This continues to be our policy since we announced our merger last year, and we will continue to follow this story. We'll have an update as they come. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We are live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.